Elden Ring. It wasn't shown at this year's Game Awards, so it might actually be another six months before we get any news at all. But to pass the time, we have this competition. Bosses and art that will help us to imagine this open world title that we know precious little about. There were hundreds of entries to this year's competition, and as always, it's a huge responsibility to rank them all. So as you look through all of these incredible entries, please remember to continually update your favorite in the top right of the video player, because I'm curious to see what you all think as well. So without any further ado, please join me in imagining Elden Ring. Number 10. This is Yggdrasil, a manifestation of Yggdrasil, the world tree. All types of art were accepted in this design competition, and pixel art was no exception. After the disappearance of the sacred tree, Yggdrasil decided to join the fight. Countless years defending the northern forest had destroyed, little by little, his own sanity. But in the end, the forest was a part of himself, and only the most intense fire could burn the branches that connect the Lost Kingdoms. So the top 10 ended up being largely defined by the categories that they scored 10 out of 10 in, and this piece received 10 points for presentation, thanks to the short video and the tidy screen that you see here. While an overgrown golem boss was a little bit common, the pixel art was excellent, the folklore pulled its weight, and the mechanical arm reference to the Elden Ring trailer was appreciated. So congratulations on making the top 10. Number 9. Star Child by Daniel Knoblich. Star Child is one of the few on this list that received full points for technical skill. The attention to detail is crazy, just look down to the splash in the water, the blood dripping down his leg, his hair whips away in the wind, and droplets of water are even flying away from his flailing necklace. This piece is insanely photorealistic, and that detail persisted across all three panels, and really helped to draw me into the world. And of all the entries, I believe this was the only frontrunner that was inspired by fairy kind, which is folklore that spread throughout early Europe. Specifically, this piece was inspired by The Star Child by Oscar Wilde, the story of a handsome boy who, for the first 10 years of his life, believes that he is truly the son of a star, as he was found deep in the woods as a baby, wearing a star amulet and a star cloak. In these images I'm showing, he's been taken in by the Fae, small creatures that worship him for his beauty. However, like them, he becomes cruel and vain, going so far as to rip the wings off other small creatures so he can wear them for his own. To stumble across this location in-game, Daniel says that the player will hear a wailing in the woods, very faint at first, but getting louder as you follow the direction of the cries. Eventually you reach an opening in the forest, revealing this scene where an old white-haired hag sits in a flat pool of water, crying and wailing. This is the Star Child's real mother, whose unsightly appearance infuriates the Star Child, causing him to lash out and initiate the boss fight with you. As the fight goes on, small fey creatures dart out from the undergrowth while you fight the Star Child, and if you as the player eventually decide to spare his life, then later on in the game you can find him enslaved and humbled by a cruel magician. So this too follows the Oscar Wilde story that it was inspired by, but as original as this folklore entry was, it's also the reason we had to give it a low lore score, as there was a lot of overlap between the folklore and the boss's supposed lore within the game. Coming up with your own lore is important, but while I would have liked to see some deviation from the folklore, as well as maybe some more overt Elden Ring references, this entry was brilliant in almost every other way, and absolutely deserves a place in the top 10. Coming in at number 8, Danu, the Puppet Knight by Celeste. The first thing everyone I show this to notices with this piece is that striking posture, that curvature of the body which is mirrored in the curvature of the weapon, 
and also in the curvature of the crown as well, which is in itself a subtle Elden Ring logo reference. Danu stands this way to reinforce that she is in fact a sort of puppet, a vessel crafted by a talented smith to protect something precious. The smith's name was Galan, and he was the craftiest man in the world, capable of making or repairing anything made of wood and iron. Every kingdom, every ruler wanted him by their side, yet one day he returned with a shiny thing that he found on a battlefield, and few ever saw him after that. The thing obsessed him, and every day, every hour, his hammer pounded away at something, but no one ever knew what, and to hide this shiny little thing, he locked himself behind an impenetrable door, and then brought the puppet knight to life to help protect the shiny thing that had destroyed his life. When you stumble upon this arena by the smith's door, Danu will walk towards you, acting disinterested, and then attacking all at once with brutal combos until she fades back into apathy. At 10% health, the puppet knight breaks her crescent weapon into pieces, revealing four arms behind her cape. She gets down on all fours and attacks at once with the shards of her broken weapon. Interestingly, you're not actually supposed to fight back in this phase, you just endure her onslaught for 12 seconds and she will fall back defeated. This piece received excellent scores for originality and also lore, but it was held back by its folklore inspirations as they were only limited to the concepts of a sort of legendary smith that you hear about in Norse legends. I would have also loved to see the smith since he features prominently in the lore, but perhaps not seeing him is intentional since he is in hiding after all. Regardless, congratulations to Celeste, truly. Of all the thousand entries that we received, this next one might be the most evocative and it manages it all with a single image. This is Hearn the Hunter, described as a set-piece boss similar to the Serpent God in Sekiro. I take this to mean that he's not supposed to be defeated, only run from, which I'm glad Kaio added because I was almost about to criticize the boss for looking undefeatable. Your goal in this place, Kaio says, is to reach this protected oak tree. But as you get closer to it, you notice enormous arrows flying past you in the forest. And then, later, you catch glimpses of this enormous thing flitting between distant trees. Eventually, it becomes a full-on chase, with this thing pulling its unwieldy limbs and weapons through the trees behind you. Hearn the Hunter is a local legend from the forests of Berkshire, likely inspired by other gods, such as the Celtic god Sonunos, who you can see in his horns, or even the Norse god Odin, whose features you can see in his single eye. Additionally, there are powerful Elden Ring references here, like the fact that it's an open world encounter, clearly, and also the multiple arm motif that we saw in the trailer. I love that there's a character hiding here, not only for scale, but to reinforce the fact that you're meant to hide and run from this boss, and I also like the multiple arms because it's a common mistake to see multiple arms carrying like tons of weapons, which wouldn't really work from a gameplay point of view, but this boss has a bow and a couple of swords. That's the right amount, I think. So while it lacks a little bit in presentation, and the lore is largely lifted from the original story of Hearn, this is an incredible entry, and it's well deserving of 7th place. But what if I told you that gameplay could be described through music? This is Oda's Ring by Ricardo Amike, and today he delivers something that's so artistic, so ambitious, that it honestly almost exists outside of the competition. The boss is called Erda, and it's a fight in two phases, fought to the tune of a giant harp that Erda plays throughout. Because his entry isn't just a boss, it's a symbolic depiction of the boss fight, set to music that Ricardo himself has composed. For example, look over to the right. Every chime you're about to hear is actually the boss attacking with blasts of wind.
This boss takes inspiration from Richard Wagner's Ring, a 16 hour long opera cycle that tells an epic story inspired by Germanic and Norse myths. In Wagner's mythology, Erda is the world's wisest woman, and she knows all of the stories that have ever been told and all that are yet to be. In Ricardo's interpretation, Erda is a fate-weaving boss, able to control your movement and even your character's stats to shape your story to her liking. Speaking of that, a bit of an easter egg is the runic text around the edges that read, I will pull the strings and down your curtain rings, and who are you to tempt your fate? Go which way my winds blow, for if you don't, I will pull the rings of fate, and so on. The fight takes place on the back of a giant lindworm, which is essentially an ancient Norwegian version of a wyvern. You, yourself, fight on the back of a chariot, chasing down Erda as she tries to escape you in phase one. We mentioned the wind blasts in the music earlier, and in this phase she also creates a fog that requires you to listen for where she is, and then you also have to deflect airstreams that whip down upon your character. None of this does damage in this phase, by the way. It just slows down your chase, for she just wants to get rid of you here. Until it's too late, of course. For in phase two, the boss sheds a tear, and then transforms horrifically into a living orchestra. Now you're the one being chased, and she rains hell down upon you. She peppers you with stat-altering arrows. A huge wolf will leap at you from the clouds. A swarm of crows dive down, and sometimes she even summons the lindworm itself to attack you from the clouds. You can hear all of this and more in the music itself, which you really should go and listen to over on Ricardo's art station, where you can just sit quietly with this piece and give it the attention it deserves because it really is a masterpiece. Ricardo won last year's prosthetic art challenge, and as a result of that, I've started working with him since then, commissioning other projects. So in order to avoid bias, this entry was not judged by me. But if I had to guess, it received sixth place because the gameplay concepts are a little bit incompatible with From Software games, and they're also missing some references to Elden Ring. While it really can't be judged by the same criteria as the rest, the technical skill, the originality, the lore, and the presentation here, they're off the charts, and Ricardo should be incredibly proud of the true art that he's created. Imagine aimlessly exploring a coastline in the open world of Elden Ring, when you come across piles of loot, swords and armor discarded at the coastline. You start picking it up, and as the world begins to darken with the setting of the sun, you look over to the horizon, and something catches your eye. It's the silhouette of a man, effortlessly standing upright in the depths of the reflective waters. And it'd be impossible to just ignore that, right? Because he's just a man, how threatening could he be? So you strip off your heavier armor to move better in the water, like the other dead warriors before you did, and you come to stand in the depths next to him, expecting to talk. This is the Nokken, who in Scandinavian folklore is described as this beautiful young man who tricks women to jump into the water with him to drown them. And as you get closer, something huge grabs you from underwater, tearing you down below, where the fight begins. This boss is inspired by Sekiro's underwater controls, which is genius because I bet From developed this system for use in Elden Ring as well, and as amazing as the underwater combat system in Sekiro was, it never really had a boss that did it justice, if you think about it, but the Nokken does. Gregory provided these graphics for the fight, something that really helps you visualize it in a fully 3D space. He says that all of these attacks are foreshadowed by gestures that the humanoid figure up top makes. There are also new mechanics here, like needing to ditch your armor to swim faster. You need to come up for air periodically, and you can also increase your dodge range if you find an underwater surface to kick off of. If you die to this boss, there's even an animation whereby you're absorbed into him, adding to the collection of failed heroes whose arms are outstretched and their faces are captured bearing their final expressions. Gregory's entry 
is a masterclass in originality, and it was a joy to imagine this boss actually existing in Elden Ring. It made me realize that Elden Ring's bosses, by virtue of the open world, will feel like they really live in the world compared to a lot of the other From Software bosses. Because now that it's an open world, it's not just about how the boss is designed, how we encounter it is also important too. Bosses like these set a really high standard for From Software to meet, and this really does help us to imagine what's possible. So, here's another entry that was fully inspired by the open world, to the point where I'm awarding it a shared third place with the entry that's to follow it. This is Pesta. She's the crone of death, or at least that's what she wants you to think. In the 14th century, the Black Plague ravaged humankind. In Norway, they called it Pesta, a Norwegian word for the pandemic, but also a personification of it. Since it had a biological cause and that was incomprehensible to people at the time, the plague took the form of an old woman, said to be ashen-faced and carrying a broom or a rake, and it's this folklore that Christian has pulled from for his boss fight. In his vision of Elden Ring, the character will stumble upon towns and villages, only to realize that they've been decimated by the plague. And just like the townsfolk of 14th century Norway, the NPCs blame Pesta, and they implore you to seek her out and kill her to end her rampage. So in this really open world style, you follow the trail of death and decay until you track her down, because she's a wandering boss and you confront her and start the fight. The battle has three phases, but they don't play out like you'd expect. In the first, her movements are slow and stiff, with long-ranged attacks of magic, corruption, poisonous smoke, and rats. In the second phase, she increases in size and desperation with these disturbing, frantic attacks. However, astute players will notice here that her hair has become more graceful and divine, a hint for her final phase and her true identity. The third phase comes after the full depletion of Pesta's health bar, when a soft and elegant voice is heard. Rats transform into crows and ravens, and the music begins again. Her rake reveals a spear within it, and a new HP bar appears, this time belonging to the Phantom Queen. That name is a translation of a name that belongs to another Celtic goddess, the Morogu, a shape-shifting Celtic goddess of war, fate, and death. The Morogu's folklore is murky, and she takes many forms. And indeed, she took many forms in this competition, as so many artists decided to depict her in different ways. However, this was the only entry that incorporated her deceptive form into the story of the boss fight itself, because it was the Morogu, the Phantom Queen in Phase 3, who was creating the plague all along, and becoming hated as Pesta, who she was in Phase 1, instead of as her true self. That's amazing. So the only entries that received a 10 for folklore were those that blended stories together in true From Software fashion. And on top of that, this piece also made incredible references to Elden Ring. And while I would have loved some visual environmental details, it scored highly in every category and it earns an undeniable place in the top three. Looking at Christian's art station, we realize that much of his work has this style that's consistent with his entry, and that's something I think is important in an artist because his work is very unique and recognizable as a result. He's an aspiring digital artist from Tampa, Florida, who's currently interested in contract or freelance work, so if your project needs an artist with inspired designs and an incredible creative flair, then this is your guy. But it was actually impossible not to put this next piece in the top three as well. Because, well, look at it. If I told you this was official concept art for Elden Ring, you'd probably believe me. This is Viserin, the Black Wing Valkyrie by Jonathan Lee. He says that the goal here was to make this boss feel intimidating yet majestic which he achieves with sharp upward angles and striking silhouettes, but then he also tried to display a depraved descent here, which he achieves with blackened wings, a crude helmet, ragged clothing, and desaturated colors. In Nordic folklore, the Valkyrie were these warriors who served Odin. They were women who escorted the souls of those who died bravely in battle to the halls of Valhalla. 
In Jonathan's story, however, Viserin was once the glory of the Valkyrie Legion and protector of the Elden Ring, tragically falling from grace when the ring was shattered. For centuries, she was outcast, forgotten, but then, one day, the echoes of the ring called for her service once again, but this time not as a protector, but as a destroyer. Valkyries were a really common entry, but Jonathan's rises above. Its design is perfectly compatible with the high fantasy of Elden Ring, the technical skill here is flawless, and the presentation could be straight out of a From Software design works. If you browse through Jonathan's art station, you may spot his entry last year to our prosthetic art competition, another entry that placed within the top 10 with this clean concept art-like design. Jonathan is an artist in San Jose, who's currently looking for work, so if your project needs an artist with insane technical and presentation skills as well, then this is your guy. And man, if you thought three and four were difficult to place, wait until you see one and two. Coming in second, by a hair's breadth, is the Naki Levy, The Terror of the Forlorn Shore, by Andre Schurstuck. The Naki Levy is a monster from Orcadian mythology, the nastiest of all the demons in Scotland's Northern Isles. Its breath was thought to wilt crops and sicken livestock, and the creature was held responsible for droughts and epidemics on land, despite being predominantly a sea dweller. The technical skill in this main image might be the strongest in the competition. You can see the sea spray from the ocean, you can feel the momentum of the clash between the two riders, and even the background complements the shape of the main clash in the foreground. It's striking, it's disturbing, it's atmospheric, and I've only just started describing the first image. On the second page, we see a breakdown of the boss's arena, which consists of deep water, shallow water, and beach all having varying effects on the player's movements, which, by the way, is largely on horseback, putting you on even footing with this Lovecraftian nightmare. As you gallop around the arena, you have to be sure to avoid the boss's plague breath, which has locked off certain parts of the arena, and from this hazard come little undead minions raised from the corpses that were on the beach before you were there. In its first phase, the Naki Levy fights with long-ranged attacks and tries to avoid melee encounters with melee attacks that attempt to sort of create distance between you both. This is the phase where you have to avoid the plague breath, and there's also another mechanic whereby if you aim the camera at the boss when it has its eye exposed, a curse status begins to be inflicted upon you, requiring you to look away at certain intervals with your camera. And if you get close to the boss, you can even cut off its tail, which gives you the Spine Lash Whip, a weapon that has a high potential to damage the wielder as well. I love that each of these weapons comes with its own lore and description and image as well about how you hold it. Damaging the boss reveals that the humanoid and the horse actually have separate health bars, and the phase two that you're about to enter depends on which one you defeated first. Defeat the rider first, and we enter phase two A against the horse, which dislocates its jaw and extends its tail for melee combat. If you're still mounted, you can actually try and get the boss to crash into barricades or rocks, and if you're dismounted, you'll have to counterattack while its jaw is open. Defeat this phase of the boss and you'll receive its dissected leg as a great hammer, which retains the lapsed anger that carried the tireless beast. However, if you defeated the horse in phase 1, then we enter phase 2b against the humanoid, who starts the fight with this almost unavoidable dismounting grab attack. From here, he uses his long-ranged homing missiles or his long arms for melee combat, depending on whether you're a fighter or a caster. Additionally, if you make the mistake of fighting him in the ocean, then he actually has a grab attack where he uses these freakishly long arms to hold you under the water and drown you. Defeat the boss in this phase, and you'll receive a staff made of its eye, which strengthens undead magic and can be used to inflict the same curse effect that the boss used against you. The artist even took replayability into account, and if you gather all three of the weapons by visiting New Game Plus, or by trading with other players, then you can receive the Guarden Maw, an enormous glaive with a special attack that mounts the player temporarily on the Naki Levy itself. This insane entry was the work of Russian artist Andre, who unfortunately has no social media or portfolio to show off for this competition, 
He says that he participated in this competition out of pure enthusiasm alone, and that if you would like to, you can contact him via the email address on screen. And the winner, with an entry that excels in originality, compatibility with Elden Ring, folklore, and unique lore, is The Drowned of Sea by Jonas Mueller. The village of Sea lay near a swamp next to a lake. The drowned bodies of missing people were frequently found in the lake, but the villagers thought this was merely part of living near the swamp. But over the years, something changed. An unnatural amount of people started to get swallowed, for something terrible lived in the water, and in time, it would devour the entire village. This lore is excellent, it's succinct and intriguing. The Drowned is inspired by two beings, first by the Kelpie, which is a supernatural water horse that was said to drown those who try to ride it, and second by the Slough, spirits of the restless dead, of people who are unwelcome in either heaven or hell. As mentioned earlier, the only pieces to get full points for folklore were those that seamlessly combine multiple inspirations, and this piece is one of them, because something entirely original has been created here as a result. And it's something that just looks as if it's straight out of a Souls game, right? You wouldn't blink twice if I told you Elden Ring had a swamp area, <laughs> which it will, probably. Just imagine that you're exploring this shallow swamp when this damn thing claws its way up to meet you. For that reason, it gets full points for compatibility with Elden Ring as well. I also love that he took the multiple arm motif to the next level, for it's the arms of the drowned that help the being swing that enormous mace that is designed to really look like it was dredged up from the bottom of a swamp. My only wish is that mounted combat could have been mentioned since the piece features the water horse in its design. Combat has two phases. First, where you fight the warrior sitting atop his horse, as the spirits keep up that appearance of fighting like a human. And then, in phase two, the drowned becomes enraged. Corpses begin to float to the surface of the lake, and they'll attack you if you get too close, while the spirits abandon all pretense of being a man on horseback and instead throw everything at you. Its movement becomes unnatural and hard to predict, as it extends the range of its attacks by chaining together corpses and summoning corpses from below the lake to jut upwards like the Firestorm Pyromancy. Because hundreds of people have been drowned over the years, and the creature has become really, really strong as a result. It's so difficult to find a single fault with this entry, and I really have no other choice but to award it first place in this boss design competition. Jonas is an environmental artist at Rice Games, and that company is lucky to have the guy, so please do me a favor and check out his portfolio and social media down below, and please join me in following not just Jonas, but everyone who participated and put their art up for display in this competition. Thank you, everyone, for this incredible work. These are some of the most talented people in the industry, and if you're an employer, or if you're a commissioner of those who create great art, then please look no further, because this is your list. This is their resume. But it goes further than the top 10, honestly. Way, way further to many of the odd thousand people who participated. Because how can I not mention The Veiled Sisters of the Eastern Mounds by Andrew Mironov, inspired by Kalak and the Morrigan? Or The Look Seath? by Rex Beck, who transforms in his second phase in a flurry of crows. There was Ogum, the sun-faced, who attacks with his voice, which was incredibly unique, and he was inspired by the Celtic god of speech. There was Nimon of the Slain Sisters, this interpretation of the Elden Ring Valkyrie in the trailer, but in a crow-like monster form. A guy called Spence even contributed this Lovecraftian creature in a sort of glowing ink that I'd never seen before. There were so many entries that had hours upon hours and hours of work in them, and it's so difficult not to include them all prominently in the video because so many people deserve it, honestly. But really, there's more to this than the judgement of myself and a couple of other artists. This is about challenging yourself and improving your art, and for a lot of you I know that this competition helped you towards that goal, even if you didn't make it in the top 10. Many of you I'll be reaching out to in the coming weeks to work on commissions if you're open, and I encourage everyone in my audience watching now, 
do this as well. Commission people beyond the top 10, scour through the Imja link in the description showing the top 100, follow their social media, or just go to their portfolios and check them out. If you have any ideas for future art competitions, let me know in the comments below. It's something I do because in the absence of Elden Ring news at the Game Awards, this artwork has helped us to imagine Elden Ring, and I like to imagine that it might inspire some other artists to pick up the craft. So, shouts out to the Elden Ring subreddit for inspiring this competition with their fake lore. Thank you for watching, and thank you for participating. Speaking of incredible art, have you guys ever heard of the game called Blasphemous? It feels like every month I would get tweets telling me that I have to play this game as a Souls fan. And now that it's super cheap as a part of this month's Humble Choice Bundle, I'm so glad I gave it a shot. So like the Souls games, you're supposed to play Blasphemous really methodically. Uh, every enemy has a weakness and a rhythm that's yours to exploit, and what's more, the game steadily builds upon your torment, adding environmental effects and hazards that require you to modify your behavior around them as well. Uh, overcoming a section eventually becomes something you're really proud of, and I'm always looking forward to the next section that crushes me because I know that when I do defeat it, I'm gonna beat it in style. Uh, so if this game is for anyone, it's for you guys. And you can get this game and two others for just $14.99 with the subscription to Humble Choice. And the price of this subscription, which gives you more than the game, by the way, is cheaper than the price of the actual game on Steam. Humble Choice is basically the new Humble Monthly. It's a way to get a ton of games, support charity, and support developers as well with your monthly subscription. This is a subscription that also affords you 20% off at their store. You get instant access to over 90 games in their trove, and you also get up to nine curated games every month. So it's always been a great deal, and it's a pretty wholesome company that I'm always proud to support. So. Please click the link down below in the description to get that deal. Uh, it expires on the 3rd of January, so get in quick. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.